I wanted to share with you a few minutes as we get ready for our message of meditation, communion. It comes out of the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. John's an interesting book, an interesting gospel, because John watched so many of Jesus' miracles and he decided that he was just going to choose seven to tell us about. He was going to choose seven miraculous, wonderful miracles that Jesus was going to perform. Each one of them was unique in human history. No one had ever done them before. Not one of the seven wonderful miracles in the Gospel of John the world had ever seen. So if you look at one miracle and then you multiply it times seven, you get what an incredible ministry Jesus had. Okay? This is number six of the seven that he chose. And I'm going to read the first opening verses if I can for you. John 9, verses 1 through uh, 11. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, and he made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like that man. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, A man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed. Then I could see. Now that's a story that takes a whole chapter to tell all the investigation that went on and all the other kinds of things. It's a long story. The whole chapter, ninth chapter of John's that story. But it reminds me of an experience I had back in college. I had a college roommate. His name was Johnny C. Hill. I'd introduced the 2020 group to Johnny C. Hill. We were the only men, the only college students of two different races that they were allowed to ever room together up to 1967. And Johnny Hill and I were of different races. And they weren't sure two guys could get along if they were a different race somehow. Remember how that used to be? Long, long time ago. Now 52 years we've outgrown that since. Johnny was black and I was white. Made for an interesting combination back in the 60s. (laughs) And we played all kinds of games together. We were good friends. Still are. And one of the things that we would do is we would pretend that one of us was blind. Now we lived in a campus, going to school on a campus in Findlay, where we were almost exactly one mile from the movie theater and the stores downtown and all the other kinds of things. So it was 10 blocks, almost exactly one mile. And uh, we decided that it would be an experiment to see what it felt like not to be able to see. And so one of us, and it was probably me, decided I'll just keep my eyes closed 
And Johnny, you tell me what's coming and what I have to adjust to. And so we'd start walking down to the movie theater or down to the store or whatever we needed to do with one person, different races, coaching the other one. Be careful, now there's a, there's a fence here or that branch is hanging down low or be careful, there's a step. That, the, the sidewalk's cracked, you'll have to step up. And be careful, that you're at the curb, you have to step down off the curb. And Have you ever had a friend that forgot to tell you there was a curb that you're going to step off of? Yeah, that happened once in a while. And we'd stumble our way down through there, and about a, all the people going by and looking at us, and, well, that's the strangest couple of guys. A minute, they work weird. And they never could figure out which one of us was blind, because the next time he would be blind, and I'd be the one coaching him and letting him fall off the curb, or whatever. And we'd pretend back and forth. Learned a lot. Man, I learned a lot during those trips. Do you realize that if you're blind, we're all the same color? You, ever, you realize that? You can't tell. Seems like we're all brothers under the skin, especially if you're blind. Anyway, there was a lot of things we learned. But one thing we didn't learn, the hopelessness of being born blind. Because all we had to do was just open our eyes and the blindness was gone. In my house, we have these wonderful things on the wall, light switches. And if I happen to walk into the house at night and I can't see anything, I just go to the wall and I click, and the light comes on, and I can see. And when I don't need the light, I just go back over and I click the light switch, and everything goes dark. I can close my eyes and I can sleep. We're so used to having the light just at our instantaneous fingertips that we don't really get serious about what it's like not to know how to ever see. This man that they were talking with had been born blind. Now, think for a second, if you will. What do the, how do you know when a newborn baby is born that it has 20-20 vision? Have you ever thought about that? Usually their eyes don't work together too good and they're, you know, they don't focus on anything very well. And newborn babies, I mean, they, they look kind of weird when you look them in the eyes. And How do you know if they can see or not? Then how could they say, and they had always said from the very first day, this is a baby who will never, ever see. You know Why? There were no eyes to see from. I have s preached on this sermon in a lot of different ways through the years, and I kind of refer to this boy as the boy with the misshapen eyes. You know how in Hebrew thought, sometimes they would make a name up for, that had a, a, a name, kind of had a meaning to it. And I kind of believe they made this boy's name to mean the boy with the misshapen eyes. Boy, did that cause problems. You know, in that time, in that day, if you were deformed in any way, you couldn't go into the temple. You couldn't offer sacrifices. In fact, if you were deformed in any way, whether you'd broken your leg and it didn't set right, or whether you, you know, had gotten you know, messed up in an accident or something, you were forbidden from that point forward of ever being able to go in and ask God for forgiveness. There was a sense that if you were deformed in any way, you were under God's curse. God didn't love you, and so God didn't take care of you. He didn't provide for you the, 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 the equipment that you needed, so he was mad at you. And he was going to condemn you to never having the forgiveness of sins or to see his smile and face. That's the way they live. He was taunted, humiliated. He was just, 
He was made to live as an outcast. And you know what? His mother and father were too. Because if they'd had, if they'd have been good people, if they'd have been God's people, he wouldn't allow them to have a son that was deformed. And they had put up with that through all the years of his life. Now, the disciples come to Jesus and say, who sinned here? Tell us where, who the responsible person is for why this disaster has taken place. And Jesus said, nobody sinned. This is so that God could show his love, could give evidence of his power and authority, and to demonstrate that I am the one who can turn on the light. He did something very unusual. He spat in the mud, brought that little clump of moist earth up, and very gently applied that dirt over the top of the place where his eyes would have been. I don't think there was any healing in that mud. I don't think there was any magic in that spittle. But that was so that he could do the miracle without somebody actually seeing how it was done. And sent the little boy, the man now, to the pool, Siloam, to wash off the mud. And when the mud was cleaned away, there were a perfectly match set of functioning eyes and he could see. Now I'm, I'm going to give you the, the miracles in about three or four different pieces. You have to have eyes, but you know something they tell me? There's a thing that connects your eye to your brain called the optic nerve. One of the most important nerves in your whole body, but it doesn't, it's not very strong when you're born. And it grows and strengthens and becomes vibrant as you use your eyes. So if a child has a problem with their eyes, like crossed eyes or something like that, they try and fix it right away so that they can begin to see accurately and the optic nerve can grow and develop and change. Not only that, but your brain has to figure out what you're looking at. <laughs> I mean, I love mashed potatoes, and I hope to have some out here in a little bit. But you know, if I've never seen mashed potatoes before, that doesn't make sense to me. My brain doesn't understand what it is. If you look at what Jesus did in the stages that he did them, he provided eyes where there were no eyes. He provided optic nerves where there were no optic nerves. And he provided the equipment in the brain to be able to understand who it was and what he saw. Three miracles all packed up into one, and it had never happened before in all of recorded history. There was a problem. He'd done it on the Sabbath day. And they didn't think that was a really good idea. The Pharisees came and they said, Jesus did a bad thing. He worked on the Sabbath day. You know what the rules are about Sabbath day, don't you? Keep it holy, keep it to the Lord. Don't do any work. Because, and here's the problem. You see, in their teaching, anyone, any person who did any work on the Sabbath day would delay the coming of the Messiah that was supposed to come and liberate all of Israel. If you did some work, even just silly things, it would postpone God's plan to bring salvation and grace and victory to, to the earth, to people, to the nation of Israel. And so the Pharisees were sitting there going, why, Jesus actually postponed the coming of God's anointed Messiah. And so they tried to figure out how they could accuse him. 
when all the time he was the Messiah. And he was standing right there in front of them. If you read the story in the ninth chapter, you'll find that they went back and they investigated, and then they called in the man's parents, and they investigated them, and, and then they called him back in, and they investigated him again. You know this man is evil. You know this man is sinful. He wouldn't have worked on the Sabbath day if he was really holy. You know this is a bad thing. And the man who was born blind said, are you kidding me? I'm sorry, I didn't quite say it that way. He said, you know God has never done this before in all of history? And he doesn't answer the prayers of an evil man. How could you say this is an evil man when he got a miracle done out of the love of God that no one has ever seen before. You know, he made a pretty good preacher. He put it right to him. And so they just got mad at him and said, you've been cursed by God since the day of your birth. Get out, and they threw him out. The problem was, of the two groups of that in that story, one group stayed in the dark. The Pharisees who were trying to judge Jesus as being an evil man never saw the light come on. There was no click. It didn't make sense to them. Their brains couldn't reach out and flip the switch and see Jesus for who he really was. But the man who was born blind, the man who had lived his whole life in the dark, is the only one in that story who got two blessings at the same time. He was given a new pair of eyes. And he had the light come on inside. He saw Jesus for who he really was. He saw Jesus not with his brand new eyes. Well, that eventually happened. Yeah, that's true. But he captured that truth in his heart. And no one was ever going to turn that light off again. He claimed it. He got it. And he was walking out of that room in the light while those who thought they could see were still in the dark, still blinded. I want you to understand as we come to this time, there's a little bit of an overlap between Bobby and the pumpkin patch and the story of the man born blind. And it's sort of like this. If you pray and ask God to show you, He will turn His light on for you. He will show you who He is. And He will make Himself real to you. And then all of a sudden you begin to see what He has in mind for you, the plan that He has in mind. But it's, it's sort of like you have to respond in your own way. You have to verbalize your own prayer. You have to put your own thoughts before the Lord. You have to say, I want to be able to see as well as the man who was born blind. I don't want to stay in the dark like those people who never recognized Jesus for the Messiah that he was. So this morning when we share communion, I'm going to ask our servers to come up and stand here in the front. And they're going to stay put right up here in the front on each side. And I'm going to have, ask if, when we've had our dedication prayer, if you will come individually up and take the elements and go back to your seats you know, any way you'd, you'd like. And then you go into a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you decide that it's time to take those elements, do it in a sense of this is the first day of being able to really see. Okay? 
If I could have somebody slip out and go upstairs and have the kids come down, I, want them, I don't want anybody upstairs to miss out on communion. And we're going to have a word of prayer together to get ready. On that last night of Jesus' life, he took two normal elements of the Passover meal. The unleavened bread that was a part of the Passover, the, the leaven, the, the, the yeast in the bread symbolized sin. And so they spent a whole week cleaning the house, absolutely scrubbing everything down to remove every element that might poison the unleavened bread. They wanted it to be pure without any mark of sin in it. No symbol of sin in it. And then he took the symbol of the cup. And it was the third cup of the four cups of the Passover. It was called the cup of redemption. And he took those two elements, the bread that had no yeast in it, no sin, and the cup of redemption, the one that will set his people free. And he passed it around and he said, these are my body and my blood that I'm giving for you. In just about 24 hours, as we remember what he did and what he shared, would you join with me in a word of prayer and preparation? Lord Jesus, we are supposed to be careful about communion. We are to remember that we need forgiveness every single time we come into your presence. We need to kind of just whisper the same prayer over and over again. Father, remove any stain of sin within me so that I can really see your presence. I can see your face. I can hear your words of comfort and grace. And so we come to you at this time of preparation for communion. And we say, Father, listen to every prayer in this room this morning as we humble ourselves before you, as we kneel in our spirits before you and say, Father, forgive us. Forgive me. Let me be a clean vessel without stain, without blemish, so that I can be a good, clean testimony of you. And let me accept your body that was broken for us. Let us accept your blood of the new covenant. And we can be filled and nourished and strengthened and revived by taking these elements into our bodies as we remember what you did to show your great love and grace for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a chance to participate. Now it's been 2,000 years and more in building a relationship with you on a day-to-day -day real basis where we can see you standing right next to us, working with us and helping and encouraging us. And we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Amen.